the planar magnetic IEM craze keeps picking up steam. Where Odyssey once dominated this niche market, you can find more and more alternatives at cheaper prices than what Odyssey offers. Last year, the 7 Hz Timeless got rave reviews and was lauded for its tuning along with its comparatively small price tag. Now, 7 Hz has released a new dynamic driver iteration that they call the Eternal. Hi-Fi Go sent me the Eternal to review. As you know, Hi-Fi Go is among a few online retailers that specializes in Chi-Fi gear. Check out Hi-Fi Go if you have got an itch to spend some cash on a wealth of audiophile gear. The Eternal sells for between $225 and $250. Let's find out what it can do. The Eternal is a single large dynamic driver IEM. While this does not sound particularly sexy, 7 Hertz hopes they can entice you with their marketing. They say that the Eternal has quote, unmatched performance. 7 Hertz claims that we should be prepared to take our musical journey to all new heights. The company says that the Eternal has quote, a natural and lively sound, whatever that's supposed to mean. Yikes. They say a bunch of stuff and yet still don't actually tell us anything useful about the IEM. That, unfortunately, is par for the course. If you have encountered the 7 Hz Timeless before, then the Eternal should seem very similar. The large circular face is consistent between the two. The design is large, just like the planar magnetic Timeless. But for the different colors, you might mistake one for the other without close inspection. 7 Hz makes a pretty big deal about using coated glass on the face of the IM, and while I'm sure that's some type of engineering achievement, it adds nothing to the experience. Still, the glass sits flush with the body, and I cannot imagine it would dislodge with normal use. The Eternal comes with an excellent assortment of accessories. You get a bivy of ear tips, a very nice cable that looks similar to the one provided with the Timeless, except of course, different color and an aluminum storage case that is identical to the one with the Timeless, except, again, in color. As for fit, well, this is going to cause a split in opinion. The large size is not going to please everyone. In fact, the Eternal is a pretty giant IEM, and it is rivaled only by the Timeless and the Blonde BL Max. If you don't like how those other IEMs fit, you'll be disappointed with the Eternal as well. I found the Eternal to be reasonably comfortable for me, and fit no differently than the Timeless. It sits securely enough, though I can feel the bulk of the IEM resting against my ear. I can wear the Eternal for about two hours before needing a break. Overall, 7 Hz provides an IEM that is very sturdy and robust. It really stretches the concept of in-ear monitor, but is otherwise well constructed. It comes with excellent accessories, and is, I think, fairly comfortable. To test the Eternal, I used it with various devices. This includes my RME ADI2 DAC, Brooklyn DAC Plus, Low 2 Paw 6000, and EcoZerta ITM03. I used the stock accessories and it installed the white white bore ear tips. I listened to my test playlist on Amazon Music HD. The Eternal does not need a powerful amp. A simple dongle DAC will be plenty of power. My tests indicate that the Eternal has close to neutral bass response. In Mountains by Hans Zimmer, there's a rumble from the beginning which builds into a crescendo. The Eternal presented this detail, but it was a little quieter than what I heard on the more neutral Moondrop Quarks. Transience was a little bit faster on the Eternal compared to the Quarks. When the crescendo hit, the Eternal separated the organ from the other instruments. The rolling thunder effect was audible, but did not drown out the other elements. When the vocals chimed in, they rose from the background until they were shoulder to shoulder with these instruments. In Conquer by Overwork, there's a rolling marble sound at the beginning. This pans from right to left to center. The Eternal presented the sound and the panning. There are multiple drums in this track and the Eternal rendered them all clearly. The various drums all had sharp, hard impact. There was minimal melding from one drum strike to the next. I listened to several hip-hop songs including Pure Water, Bupatek, Reel It In, and Uproar. On each occasion, the Eternal presented the sub bass, but the transients was just a little bit faster than what I heard on the quarks. The subwoofer always sounded like it was at the middle of a medium-sized room. The vocals were two steps ahead of the instruments and retained their sparkle. The drums were a little louder than the sub bass. 
I listen to my Sicario playlist. I use these tracks to determine if there's any audible bass distortion. Traversing from low to high volumes, I could not hear any distortion. Overall, the Eternal seems to have close to neutral bass. Transience is a little bit faster than on the neutral quarks. Clarity in this region is slightly above average. My tests indicate that the mids are forward and slightly sibilant. In Orla Gartland's Why Am I Like This, there is natural vocal grain and sibilance mixed into the track. The Eternal presented both details and emphasized the sibilance a little. The Eternal sibilance rendition was a bit louder than what I heard on the quarks. Orla's voice was two steps ahead of the instruments. The quarks in comparison presented Orla's voice one step ahead of instruments. There was minimal melding among the various instruments. In Watch You Back by Haim, the Eternal again showed that it does slightly emphasize vocal sibilance. This was a bit more than what I heard on the quarks. At 8 seconds into the track, the primary singer says the word we and drags it out, making it sound gravelly. The Eternal rendered this detail. There are two backup vocalists, one in either channel. The Eternal initially presented all three vocalists clearly with their individual tonalities. When the instruments played at maximum, the backup vocalists melded into one voice. The drums, bass, guitar, and piano remained clear with marginal melding among their notes. The vocals remained two steps ahead of the other elements. In Superposition by Young the Giant, the Eternal presented the ukulele, drums, and bass. All instruments melded their tonalities together slightly. The primary male vocalist was one to two steps ahead of the instruments. His sibilance did not appear to be emphasized. There's a backup vocalist whose voice is layered beneath the primaries. Most IEMs and headphones cannot reveal this subtle detail. The Eternal just barely presented the second voice, but I had to concentrate to pick it up. Between 1 minute and 10 and 1 minute and 20 seconds, there are sharp intakes of breaths. The Eternal presented this detail. Overall, the Eternal seems to have forward mids with particular attention to vocals. There's a marginal emphasis of female vocal sibilance. My tests indicate that the Eternal has an upper treble roll-off. In Skirts of Rex Wings, the Eternal presented the brass and horns clearly. Their nasally signatures were easily audible. However, the higher pitched notes seemed a bit recessed, less loud than what I heard on the more neutral quarks. This difference was not significant, but noticeable in an A-B test. The timpani was audible, but did not drown out the other instruments. The Eternal has some width and depth, but no verticality. In other words, some instruments seemed further out into the wings, some sounded like they were deeper into the room, but no sounds came from above or below. In Flight from the City, the Eternal made the piano sound like it was six feet away. Its bassy notes had slightly faster transients than what I heard on the quarks. The cello was as loud as the piano. Both instruments melded their tonalities only slightly. I heard the pops and sizzles, the electric buzzing effects, creaking of wood on the pianist's bench, and the shifting of the cello's weight. In Take 5 of the De Brubeck Quartet, the Eternal rendered the piano in the right, drums in the left, saxophone center, and bass one step behind. All instruments melded their tonalities, but none seemed veiled in the mix. The saxophone was the loudest, most obvious element in the mix. The saxophone's higher pitch notes seemed a little bit quieter than what I heard on the quarks. The cymbals were nearly as loud as the saxophone. The cymbals are struck at different positions, which should result in varying tonalities. The Eternal did render these differences. Overall, the Eternal seems to have an upper treble roll-off. There's no harshness in the treble region, even at high volumes. 7 Hertz doesn't say anything about the detail ability of the Eternal. My experience with this IEM was kind of a mixed bag. On the one hand, I could hear obvious and some subtle details without difficulty. On the other hand, not all details were necessarily clearer than what I heard on the far cheaper quarks. Throughout my time with the Eternal, I never felt that I was getting greater detail retrieval than what I've heard on many other IEMs. The Eternal did not suddenly open my music to slight variances that I had not previously noticed on IEMs such as the Tin Hi Fi T2 or the WG T2. In fact, my experience with the Eternal was a little above average. Creaking of wood, shifting of a cello's weight, sharp intakes of breaths, multiple vocalists, twangs of guitar strings, nasally signatures of brass and horns, these types of details are clear. But subtle, nuanced details are not much clearer on the Eternal than on far cheaper IEMs like the Quarks. For a more quantitative test, I used the song New Light by Kazuki. This track has layers of details, including the sound of children playing, wind, rustling of grass, synth, 
piano, and footsteps. I count the number of steps I can hear in the first 60 seconds. The WGT2 presents 9 to 10 footsteps. The Heidi's MS2 presents 8 to 9. The Tin Hi Fi T2 and T2 Evo present 7 to 8. The Mudra Barrier presents 7 footsteps. The T2 Plus, Blonde BL05, and the The Audio Legacy 2 present 6 to 7. The Moondrop Starfield presents 6. The Moondrop Corks, Blonde BL03, and Triple Wind Melee each present 5 to 6. And the Eternal rendered 7 footsteps. For my detailed resolution scale, I use the Moondrop Aria and Starfield as the average performers. Any IEM that provides more or less footsteps is judged accordingly. Thus, on my scale, the BL03 would be considered below average and the Ten Hi-Fi T2 would be above average. Using this standard, it seems clear to me that the Eternal has average to maybe above average detail retrieval. Of course, changing ear tips or insertion depth in your own music may render different results. 7Hz says nothing about the Eternal's soundstage ability. My test suggests this IEM has slightly above average soundstage. The Eternal does not present a 3D experience. While you might hear some width and depth, the Eternal does not present verticality. Of course, the original recording has a lot to do with this as well. Just as with the detail resolution test, I also have a scale for soundstage. For me, this involves, yet again, using the Moondrop Aria and Starfield as the average performers. Anything that has greater or lesser soundstage is judged accordingly. The Tin Hi-Fi T2 and ID's MS2 have above average soundstage. The Blonde BL03 and Blonde BL05S are average at best. The Starfield, Aria, and Quarks are average. I would place the Eternal as slightly wider than the Moondrop Aria. However, it appeared to me that the T2 was significantly wider than the Eternal. If you've listened this far, then you might have an idea of what the Eternal kinda sounds like but there is no substitute for listening to headphones and IEMs yourself. Looking only at graphs or only listening to people fumble to explain what they hear is a far cry from listening to headphones and high EMs. Unfortunately, 7Hz does not give any meaningful suggestion about the sound signature. It's poor form when a company that designed a headphone or IEM cannot figure out a way to effectively communicate how they tune the sound. Here, 7Hz says that the Eternal has natural and lively sound. This is a concept which will be different for different people. I can't describe natural sound to you any more than I can tell you what lively is supposed to mean. Having said that, I think generally speaking, the Eternal has a dark, relaxed sound signature, if that isn't vague enough. The bass seems to be close to neutral. There's more clarity in this region on the Eternal than on the neutral Moondrop Quarks. Transience is a bit faster on the Eternal as well. The mids are forward. Vocals stand apart from instruments but closer to the ears. In other words, it seems like the singer is only a few feet away from your ears. Female vocal sibilance is marginally emphasized. The treble is rolled off at the top end. I also got the feeling that the mid treble has a reduction, but I can't be sure. Regardless, treble is relaxed and far from harsh. The Eternal has about average to maybe above average detail and slightly above average soundstage. If you're not super sensitive to sibilance, then I'd say that the Eternal is a fairly inoffensive sounding IEM. But if you like V-shaped sound, then the Eternal is going to be a big disappointment. If you want the type of clarity you can get with the Ten Hi-Fi gear, then the Eternal is not it. But for a gentler experience, the Eternal provides a balanced, warm sounding signature, one that leans towards vocal presence. It's important we compare gear. That's the only way we can tell whether the newest hyped gear is actually worth the hype. Here, we're going to compare the Eternal against the Timeless, of course, and the Final Audio B2. For this test, I used the stock accessories. I plugged each IEM into a passive AB switch that was connected to my Brooklyn DAC Plus. I listened to my test playlist on Amazon Music HD, and I tried to volume match. The Timeless and Eternal have very different bass responses. The Timeless has a roll-off while the Eternal is closer to neutral. The Timeless has faster transients and more separation between sub-bass and mid-bass. Mid-bass impact is harder on the Eternal. There's more bass bleed into the mids on the Eternal. The mids are forward on both IEMs. Both emphasize vocal sibilance in similar ways. 
mid-centric clarity is more obvious on the timeless, and instruments have more separation among each other on this IEM compared to the Eternal. The Eternal has a roll-off in the upper treble. The timeless is closer to neutral. There's more clarity and separation of treble instruments on the timeless. Neither IEM sounds harsh at high volumes, but the Eternal is overall gentler in this region. The Timeless has greater clarity and detail. In my new light test, it presented eight clear footsteps. The Timeless also has slightly wider soundstage. The B2 and Eternal have somewhat different bass response. Both are close to neutral, though the Eternal has marginally greater separation of sub-bass from mid-bass. Transience is perhaps just slightly faster on the Eternal. Mid-bass impact is a little harder on the Eternal. Both IEMs emphasize mids. Both push vocal semblance in very similar ways. Voices are perhaps just a little bit clearer within a mix on the Eternal. However, voices are similarly close to the ears on both IEMs. Treble is, again, similar. Both the B2 and Eternal have a treble roll-off near the top end. I thought that the B2 had just a tiny bit more clarity in the mid-treble region, but that could just be a mistake on my part. Neither IEM sounds harsh. The Eternal has overall slightly greater clarity and detailed retrieval. In my new light test, the B2 rendered six footsteps. Both IEMs have similar soundstage. Comparisons help us figure out what's going on with new products. Is it the typical reviewer hype or something special? Well, hopefully you have a bit more information to help answer that question regarding the Eternal. What seems obvious is that the Timeless and Eternal do not sound the same. While they share some similarities, listening to one is not like listening to the other. The B2 and Eternal share more commonalities, however. Both are darker sounding, fairly relaxed sound signatures. Yet, the Eternal does present a little bit more detail and clarity. Whether any of these IEMs will be to your liking is something only you can decide. There are so many IEMs that it's not that difficult to find one that sounds very similar to another. There's only so much you can do given the driver and size limitations overall. I do not believe in sound signature or performance having a particular price tag. Some people think that you just have to settle for compromises under say $500, or that nothing under $1,000 comes close to the performance of a product that costs over $1,000. And I think that's all nonsense. For example, the Tin Hi-Fi T2 and WG T2 remain two of the clearest, most detailed IEMs with some of the widest soundstage I've heard, and I've tested a lot of IEMs. So when you talk about performance in a price range, you're going to need to be far more specific. Frankly, when reviewers and forum commentators talk about performance, what they're really talking about is sound signature they might genuinely like the sound of a $1,000 IEM and think nothing else comes close, and that's perfectly fine. But that is not an objective standard. The point behind all of this is to emphasize that if you ask whether the Eternal is worth it, I'd have to tell you to figure that out yourself. All I can say is that once you have some idea of what the device sounds like, you have to use a more pragmatic analysis before spending your money. So let's put sound signature aside for the moment. We've already talked about it, and if you didn't watch the previous portions of this video, you should. Instead, let's focus on what you get for around $230 with the Eternal. You get excellent build, great accessories, and a reasonably comfortable fit. While the Eternal is a fairly large device, it is not the heavy monstrosity that is the BL Max. These are very important aspects to any audiophile headphone or IEM. If the build is poor, the accessories lackluster, and the comfort unacceptable, why would you spend your money on it? Ultimately, I think 7Hz does give you enough, objectively speaking, to at least make a case for the Eternal's price tag. Now, when we talk about sound signature, the fact that the Eternal has a relaxed presentation, that is something only you can accept or reject. If the Eternal seems to be something that might interest you, given all the information, then I think its asking price is reasonable.